in the way I look at it is, it's like almost like a download from God. Like somebody's connecting to something that is just beyond any normal level of performance and, and almost like in, in this flow state is certain people who live in almost a constant flow state of creativity. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome Troy Carter to the show. Troy is the co-founder and CEO of Venice Music, a technology and media company focused on powering the business of music via distribution, services, and data analytics. Formerly, Troy was the founder and CEO of Adam Factory, where he rose to prominence, nurturing the careers of global superstars, including Lady Gaga and John Legend. He most recently served at Spotify as its global head of creator services, overseeing the company's growth strategy for artists and record labels. In this episode, I talked to Troy Carter about spotting creative potential. Working in the entertainment industry has given Troy an eye for talent, but that's not all it takes to become successful. Hard work, determination, and letting your personality shine through are also key components. Troy and I talk about musical geniuses and the future of the music industry with the advent of sophisticated AI tools. It was really great chatting with Troy. He's like my brother from another mother. I just adore Troy and think he's done such legendary work for the music industry. And he's just so humble and just so cool. It was also really cool talking about mutual connections with high school. Turns out he went to the same high school that uh, my grandmother uh, was vice principal of in West Philly High. She wasn't vice principal at the time, but he went to that high school. So we both come from Philadelphia and it was just great to just connect with him and riff on how to spot creative potential. So I know you'll really enjoy this episode. So without further ado, I bring you Troy Carter. Troy Carter, welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Dr. Scott, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm really good. I'm looking forward to doing like a podcast improv jam today with you on creativity. It's a complete freestyle session. I completely said it do- doesn't matter what we talk about, wherever you want to go, I'm going. That's true. We have we have literally no, no agenda, <laughs> nothing in the to-do list. But I am I'm fascinated with your your whole the whole arc of your journey and um and you know, we both grew up in Philly. Uh, you grew up in probably some would say proper Philly. <laughs> I was in the main, main line, main line of Philadelphia. <laughs> That's what we call it. Yes, proper, proper, proper yeah. Philly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, my grandma, and grandparents, they grew up in proper Philly. My grandma was a vice principal of West Philly High, and you went to West Philly High. I went to West Philly High. Yeah, I think she. I think she was vice principal before your time, but. Yeah, you know, you grew up just in such a amazing era of creativity and flourishing um, within the hip hop community. Within, I mean, I love hip hop, so I'm I'm just well, I'm enjoying to nerd out with you today about hip hop, <laughs> not psychology. <laughs> we'll get to some psychology, but but can you? There's almost would you describe it as like almost a renaissance there in Philly during that time period? Take us. Can you take us back to to that? Your middle school days, let's say. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely was was a was a renaissance. You know, um, I got lucky to be born when I was born and where I was born, because like coming up in like the early 80s in Philly, hip hop was like really at its golden age. So you figure like 1987, 1988, you think about the clothes, you know, the Dapper Dan so the Gucci sweatsuits, the big name belts with your name on it, you know, the uh, Kazal, Kazal glasses, um, everything that you saw in Run DMC music videos with the Adidas with no shoestrings. Graffiti was, you know, becoming, a, you know, uh, uh, an artistic medium and uh, DJing. So you had all of these things sort of happening at one time. And it was it was this generational shift from sort of the the music that my parents and my aunts and uncles grew up to, to this sort of generation of music that we called our own. And so it, it, it definitely was a renaissance on every block in the neighborhood, by the way. What I would give to, to have been a part of that. Wow. You met, you knew DJ Jazzy Jeff, right? Yes. Yeah. And you knew Will Smith and you knew Boys to Men, right? Right when they were starting. 
that must have been around 1988. That feels, I feel like that's around their, their first record, right? Yeah. We used to, you know, we had a rap group, um, me and my two best friends called too, too many, you know, we met in high school, ninth grade. And, um, and it was three of us and, you know, we called ourselves too, too many because it was only enough money for one of us at any given time. <laughs> so, so we, it was always That's too, good. too many, That's and, but we used to do these local little talent shows and boys to men was part of that sort of talent show circuit. And they went to the creative and, uh, the high school of creative and performing arts. Um, it was a band called square roots that was part of that circuit that um, later changed their name to The Roots. And of course, we know what happened, you know, with those guys. It was a, um, a local rapper who was a friend of ours who also worked at a clothing store um, called City Blue in, in Philly. And, you know, she moved to Atlanta. We didn't hear back from her. And we turn on TV one day and, and he has this uh, condom over one eye and it's Lisa from TLC. Oh my left gosh, eye. it's left eye. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was left eye. So, wow. it, you know, that's, that's the sort of creative community, you know, and Philly's so small, such a small, like it's a, it's a big, small town. And, you know, so we all knew each other and, um, and it was beautiful just to see like early in my childhood, this, these thoughts of endless possibility because no one really experienced failure you know, at that point in their lives yet. So like, you know, seeing your, your friends and, um, and peers become, you know, break Elvis Presley's records on the charts or become the biggest girl group of, of all time or watching well, you know, become, go from a local rapper to, you know, movie star. It just was, you just thought anything was possible. Were the seeds of your legendary talent management clearly evident? around that time like do you feel like you had like a keen eye even as a kid like to spot talent and spot potential yeah you know my i think my talent back then that sort of carried over wasn't necessarily to spot talent at that point it was protecting my friends you know so with my mm -hmm. with my rap group i ended up being like the default manager because i wanted to read the contracts and sort of understand the business side of it so, um, and so I always was like the one who would organize everything. And so I wasn't the most creative person, but I was really good at, at organizing. And so being around creative people led to sort of creative organization. And so, um, but I really, it, it wasn't about spotting talent as back then, as much it, as it was, how can I organize this chaos? And, and, I, and I think the other thing that carried over from that period of time, I've always been good with managing um, crisis, you know, and I, and I think from, you know, having to live through trauma and struggles and things like that, I always tried to be this sort of calm in the midst of the storm. And yeah. I think that's one of the number one qualities for like a, a, a good manager is somebody who can, you know, really be be that calm voice and that that and that people feel like they could depend on when when things hit the fan yes yes not you know not just in the music field but i feel like that you're good to have around in any context <laughs> it's not just musicians that need that <laughs> psychologists need that too brother <laughs> <laughs> so you were you were signed to Will Jam Records. People might not have heard How'd of Will Jam that? Records. How did you dude, know that, dude? I'm a real I'm a real nerd. I'm a real nerd about hip hop, uh, especially the early days. You're the um, only person in the world who knows that. By the way, Will I love Jam that. that and so you didn't even funny. tell me that. Yeah, because I believe uh, Will Smith and James Lasseter were part of that record label. Yes, right? yes. Will Will so, Jam. Will and James. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Um, so, I mean, how many people could have possibly been signed by Will Jam Records? I mean, you must have been such a small group of up and coming <laughs> hip hop artists, right? It, it was it was grand, grand opening, grand closing. It was right, you know, right, it, right, right. <laughs> we, were, we were the first and only act that, that was signed yeah. to the company. <laughs> oh, is that true? You read really was just oh, you. Oh, yeah, it was just us. <laughs> <laughs> the record probably fell. So we probably bankrupted the company. The record did so terrible. <laughs> oh, that's so great. But I, if I remember correctly, did you did you ended up working with uh, James Lasseter later on in your career? Is that right? 
Yeah, you know, James is still a, a good friend and mentor. And, you know, I had dinner with him last week, you know, so it's oh, been, nice. you know, over thir- over thir- almost 33 years, you know, he's, he's, he's been in my life. And uh, but he was a guy who he was the most mature guy in the, in the neighborhood, sort of got the job, you know, being Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince's manager, you know, because he was the only guy with a car and, uh, and, and a fax machine. And so uh, J- James has always been like the buttoned up guy, but he he just saw some potential in me. And um, even when I was really rough around the edges and he gave me these opportunities and even when I screwed the opportunities up, you know, he gave me second chances and third chances and fourth chances and um, and helped me see the potential in myself. Well, that's that's beautiful. And I assume you carried that forward and. You know, you 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 now have you have such a good eye for spotting potential in in artists. I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self actualization coaching intensive. While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Self-actualization coaching is a whole person approach to coaching that aims to help the client find their most alive and creative center of being, connect deeply with themselves, and become who they truly want to become. Grounded in the foundational principles of humanistic psychology, self-actualization coaching also draws from the latest psychological science, including the fields of positive psychology, coaching psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, neuroscience, and the science of creativity. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Register today and get 20% off. Don't miss out on this very special event. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org and get 20% off today. I look forward to welcoming you in December. What would you say is actually your your superpower within what you do? I don't want to t- tell you what it is. I want you to tell me, what do you think it really is? It, it, it really is about potential and, and really being able to see something within people. Hmm. And willing to take that that chance, you know. Um, I, I'm really drawn to underdogs. So, Me too. You know, yeah, I love I love underdogs. You know, mm-hmm. so most of the artists, if not pretty much almost all the artists that I've ever worked with, were either starting from the very beginning of their careers before anybody knew who they were, or they were at some sort of midlife critical point in their career trying to figure it out. And mm-hmm. so, being able to sort of see see the potential and dive in and, and, and do the work and not let the, not let the end result scare the shit out of me. <laughs> you worked with uh, the Notorious B.I.G. Yes. And uh, I'm a huge Biggie fan. <laughs> so what was he like as, you know, behind the scenes? Like, did you like actually like party with him? No, you know, I was, so Biggie was funny with Biggie. I was, a, um, I was promoting shows in Philly. Mm-hmm. And um, and like little neighborhood shows at like places that held, you know, two, three hundred people. And when he put out his first music, I tried to book him for a show um, and he was ended up being a no show because he was shooting um, the Big Papa video in New York. And um, but, you know, we we ended up after that doing like two or three more shows with, with him and Junior Mafia. And um, I got to know Puff. Puff gave me an internship. Uh, and um, and it was like being able to see this guy's creative process, but also he was this guy who was incredibly quiet, incredibly charming, incredibly funny as, as, as well, and um, and whose life was just cut way too short before mm. we saw you know the best of what the, what he had to offer to the world, you know, because when we look at Jay Z now 
you know, we got a chance to see Jay-Z go through, you know, the roughest periods, you know, sort of coming out of Marcy Projects, mm. super rough around the edges, you know, um, misogynistic, you know, all of the things that people would say to seeing this guy become, you know, a leader, um, activist, father, business, business titan, you know, so, and, you know, and the same thing with Diddy, same thing with Dr. Dre, you know, we got the, to see these guys uh, through their full potential. And with Biggie, you know, I think we would have seen it. We, we, we would have seen the same thing. And, um, and it's just too bad. It was cut short. I assume you were absolutely gutted when you heard about the news. Do you remember where you were when you heard about the news? I, I, I do. I was um, at my house on Dewey street in Philadelphia Wow. Um, with my, I think my son was one and a half years old mm. in the room with him. And, um, and my girlfriend at the time, um, my son's mother walked in the room and, and told me what happened. Mm. It's still unbelievable. Cause, and, and, you know, cause nowadays you hear about rappers getting killed once a month, but you never heard about celebrities getting killed back then. It's like, you, you might've heard like, overdoses or like, you know, Jimi Hendrix getting, you know, oh, oh, Jimi Hendrix overdosing, you know, like you, you heard things like, the, you know, the, these sort of stories like that, but for a celebrity to be murdered, you know, sort of cold blood, it just was not normal. And, um, you know, so it, it's still to, to, even to this day, it still, still kind of haunts me that that could happen. Do you know who killed him? No. And I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to know don't, either. I don't no, want to you know. know. You, you know what? It's like because those days, I, I remember I was working for 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 Diddy when Tupac got shot in New York. This isn't when he got killed in oh. Vegas. When he first got shot in New York, and I remember, you know, I was an intern, so I would have to answer the phones. Right. And I remember like the death threats, like bad boy records, man, help you. Oh yeah. I'm going to kill everybody in the building. Uh, okay. I'll take, I'll take the message. Thank you for calling. Uh, but you know, the security everywhere. Uh, and, um, you know, it just was a rough time in hip hop where, and it was a dark time in hip hop. You know, you just never want to go back to it, but the streets were so closely aligned with the music back then. And, you know, so you know, to come out of that period, you know, for, for myself coming out of that period, it's just not something I ever want to go back to. Oh, I hear you. I totally hear you. Um, so zooming in on the, the creativity of, of these individuals, though, during that period, I mean, there was this real special kind of creativity. I'm just wondering, how much do you think like the East Coast, West Coast sort of competition upped the, 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 the creativity or was it, do you think it was just completely unnecessary? Oh, it, you know, it up the creativity like, it, you know, it's it's the that's the beauty about hip hop. It's almost like the the WWE where, you know, it's, it's the is these, it, you know, outside of the, the corner cases of violent beefs. It's always been this um, battle rap. You know, that's that's just the culture of rap. And so with battle rap, you is very is all, all about the bravado. You're better than this other person. And, and so you put so much into your craft that whatever record that you're making has to be better than that last record that your rival made. And so it's this, this ongoing rivalry in music that keeps up in the level of music. I think uh, we, we, we really never saw that in music before. Like, you know, where it, like hip hop is almost like a competitive sport, like, you know, where is is one year where Kanye West won the championship, then Drake comes along and wins the championship. Lil Wayne won the championship. Jay Z won a championship. Cardi B won a championship. So it's like every year you want to see like who who's gonna own the summer. Next up, watch out, Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott. Forget Next Dr. Up. Dre. <laughs> <laughs> don't be dr scott next year next year watch out doc, watch doc, out we, we should do a versus with dr dre versus dr scott 100 percent, 100 percent. i'm like i i just i i'm obsessed with this notion of the x factor you know there's this kind of um assumption that you either have the x factor or you don't have the x factor you know you have come across so many people have you come across situations where you didn't think someone really had the X factor when you first met them, but they worked their ass off and they kind of developed something really special. Or do you really kind of believe this, this myth, so to speak, that you either born with it or you're not? 
I don't I don't believe you're born. I don't believe you're born with it or, or not. Like, you know, I think some certain things, you know, um, come with some level of God given ability. Um, but in, mu- in music, I don't think that's the case. Like, just as an example, you know, like Lady Gaga, she was a she 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 was a piano singer. And she got signed to Def Jam and Def Jam dropped her from the label within less than a year because the, the CEO of the label didn't get her. And um, and after she got dropped, she met a friend of mine, Vincent Herbert, who in, and Vince introduced her, you know, to, uh, he introduced the two of us. But Vince helped her develop into who she eventually became. He introduced her to Lorianne Gibson, who was one of the best choreographers in the world. And um, and Gaga wasn't a dancer and she worked every single day, hours to learn how to dance. She watched so much tape of David Bowie interviews and and Madonna concerts and like all all she she Michael Jackson Prince she would study the greats. So it's like and 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 even down to songwriting she studied pop songwriting. So so it was a lot of work that went into what she was able to create. And so she just didn't wake up one day and, and, and was born Lady Gaga. She was born Stephanie Germanata and, and developed into that through, 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 through the work. There's nobody with a harder work ethic. Something that's really interesting about that, though, is that, yes, like she developed into the person she wanted to be or the, the person she saw in her mind to be. And that's what's interesting about this. And you see this a lot with all the legends, you know? is this sort of like vision or falling in love with an image of the future that is uh, to connect it to psychological research. That's E. Paul Torrance's famous creativity study found the elementary school kids that grew up to be the most creative were those who fall in love with a future image of themselves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just um, focusing on Lady Gaga, because you really, in a lot of ways you, you discovered her, you believed in her, you know, you believed in her potential. You told me something once that, you know, even before she was famous, she would walk around like she was famous. Yes. That's, yes. that's, that's clear that she had a vision of who she, who she was meant to be. We called it the, the delusion. And uh, <laughs> because, you know, you, you have to be semi delusional. You got to have a healthy per, uh, percentage of delusion to, to really, truly believe, you know, you're going to become the biggest star in the world and nobody just sees it yet. Mm. And your team has to buy into it as well. So it's like, you know, we have this shared delusion of what the future is going to look like. And of course you have to, you're delusional if you don't work towards it or you don't write the right music or, you know, so, you know, so it's it's work you got to put into it, into it every day, but you have to be so clear and, and being able to, to, to see the vision. And, you know, it was, and it, it sounds super corny, but one of the things that, you know, she and I bonded over was uh, was seeing that that remember the movie The Secret? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and and because since a kid, you know, since ninth grade, we always me and my best friends had this thing about how thoughts become things. Mm-hmm. And um, and I used to write down everything, like everything mm-hmm. that I wanted to accomplish, you know, probably since I was like nine or 10 years old, I used to write everything down and it's crazy. I, my mom saved like my old scrapbooks and notes. And it's, wow. it's, it like blew me away to go back and see some of the, some of the things. And so that was a shared thing, like for, for, for the two of us to have was that we knew, we know how you can uh, envision something and through execution and real, um, real focus you can make it happen. And so, you know, and so, and, and I can tell you some craziness, but like, you know, e- even how she came about into my life, like just through, you know, I had gone through a really terrible time in, in my life where I pretty much had lost everything. And I started just meditating and doing a lot of inner work. And I started putting together uh, sort of vision boards of what my future wanted, what I wanted my future to be. Yeah. And I put up these pictures of like Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, like all of these big pop stars. And I'm like, 
I want to be in a pop star business. So this mm-hmm. is something I started working towards and, and like going down this deep rabbit hole. And then, you know, here she comes popping up in my life. So it's almost like the preparation sort of was waiting for the opportunity. Yes. There's something really that I really fully understand scientifically about this. Um, but I've noticed that as well, because I can't say the, the secret is completely scientifically accurate um, in the sense that if you don't do anything, you know, you just vision something it's it, it manifested automatically that that there's no real good science suggesting that's true that's <laughs> almost like that's magic that's like uh hey genie hey genie i have three wishes i'm gonna make you know but being able to there is something really true about when you have a certain vision and you believe in it so much the universe kind of starts to come together you know, to make it happen in in some way that just is beyond my comprehension. I, I just, I wish it was something that was taught in school yeah. and that kids like that every kid knew that, that, that this existed because yeah. like I got lucky because I was, I was this kid with this crazy imagination mm-hmm. and, um, and just would make up these wild, crazy stories. And, you know, like I always had this wild imagination. So my surroundings never dictated like in my mind what my future was going to be like. So, so it was weird. Like I was sort of locked within my own imagination. And so I got lucky with it to sort of stumble upon it, but I just wish it was something that, um, that just was sort of in, in basic everyday learning. Yeah, me too. Um, you said something in one of your interviews that I was like, this is, Yes, this, yes, this. And you said, you said the following, be willing to bet on yourself. Yep. So much stems from that one sentence. So much, right? Like, you know, you, there is something to the idea that you create your own reality uh, for good or bad, you know, and uh, a lot of people don't want to hear that because I think like a lot of people want to outsource their happiness yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to, to that group or that group or that group, you know, like anyone but myself, <laughs> but you know, kind of that kind of responsibility is, uh, well, it's scary. It's scary because it you have a lot to lose. Scary. It's, yeah. su- it's so much easier to think that, um, that God is going to decide every single decision for you. And he has like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's not on you. It's, 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 so, it's so much easier to sort of um, de- default to that. So I understand, you know, why religion is, is, is super, is super important. But when you realize that, you know, a lot of this responsibility for your life falls in your, in your own lap and that, you know, the sort of decisions that you make today dictates what happens, you know, tomorrow, essentially, you know, it, it, it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of inner work and, um, and, a, and constant iteration and, and learning. And so that's hard, you know? So, so for me, you know, I came to this conclusion uh, that life is really short, man. Life mm-hmm. is really short. And a lot of people and I and like, you know, super personal story, you know, my, my, my mom, um, she passed away, um, almost 10 years ago and she was young, she was 63 years old and her dream was to go to Alaska and she never got to go. And you think about how much stuff we defer in our, in our, in our lives, you know, because we think tomorrow is going to be here, but Th- th- those are no, those aren't guarantees. So in my mind, the way I look at it is I got to figure out, like, I got to, I want to live the life that I want to live. I want to wake up doing what I want to do every single day and which, which I do. And, you know, meaning it's you know, everybody works for somebody. I work for my customers and, you know, mm-hmm. and my, and my employees and my and family, but, you know, but ultimately is something that that I truly enjoy, and the only way you you I just I just figured that you know what if at the end of the day worst case scenario if if it if it doesn't work out I'll have a nice place to live in West Philly at my grandmother's house. 
<laughs> in the meantime, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bet on, I'm a bet on myself all day long. Oh, I love that. Bet on yourself. Yeah. So what, let's talk about some other characteristics you've noticed among people that would r- approach genius status. I mean, are, are there, are there that many people you think you've encountered in your career? You would actually put at the genius level. Yes. Like it, it, there's, it's a ham, it's a handful that um, I would put at genius level creativity. Quincy Jones. You remember when I was at your dinner party, I would just like mention people I'd be like, is this person a genius? We played it. We played a little, <laughs> is this person a genius game? <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember. <laughs> your dinner, I remember. And I was like, I was like, I is remember. this person a genius? Is that person a genius? And, uh, and you, and the, God bless you for going with it. But um, anyway, I won't do that today. I won't do that today. Okay. Yeah, don't Continue. put me on the spot. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> I won't. I won't. <laughs> I won't do that today. I promise. Okay. This but Quincy there, Jones. Some, some people are geniuses. Some people are lucky, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Qu- 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 Quincy Jones is an absolute musical genius. Like, no, no, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. I think John Mayer is, is a genius at, um, and savant at guitar. Like, you know, it's just what, like, in, it's, and the way I look at it is, is like almost like a download from God. Like somebody's connecting to something that is just beyond any normal level of performance and, and almost like in, in this flow state. And when you see people who, it's, so, it's certain people who live in almost a constant flow state of creativity and they're able to go in and out of it. You know, so, certain people will see um, will be project based and it's like, they'll make a really great album. And then you never hear anything great from that person again, essentially, Mm -hmm. because they were in that genius state at that particular time. And then there's certain people who, who, who's consistently gone back to that, to, to that state. Quincy Jones by far in my life has been one, one person who's just has been consistent. I think in, in hip hop, Dr. Dre, hands down is just a genius music, like music producer. I think I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there when we talk about sort of like levels of consistent over generations, you know? So like we we're talking over decade, over decade, over decade. And so I think a lot of talent um, that I work with, I think they have a lot of genius possibility and I think a lot of genius potential and um, but the body of work is so young that we haven't been able to see it and call it within that category of a Quint of what I can call a Quincy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's totally fair. Um, I not going to Prince was a genius not- too, by the way. Oh yes. Yes. I won't ask you to confirm or deny this, but I think Michael Jackson was a genius. You don't have absolutely. to confirm or deny that. But- a- absolutely. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. A- Absolutely, one hundred percent. Michael Jackson and, was was a genius, and, and glad we're agreed on that. Um, it seems like you know the thing that is so special about him is something similar that is so special about like Michael Jordan, uh, and and it is it does get down to this flow sort of idea. Something seemed so effortless. Mm-hmm. Something seemed so. God given. <laughs> um, no, and, no, 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 it's funny. Yeah, I think geniuses yeah. are so good at what they do. They make it look effortless. Cause, yeah, cause when you think yeah. about um, like a, yeah. a, a friend of mine told me a, a story, you know, this is, I think this was Kobe Bryant's second year in, in the league. And he was working on a music project in New York and he was staying with a friend of mine. And um, and he was telling me how every morning Kobe would get up and go out to the basketball court with his with um, his trainer and the the trainer would put his hand in Kobe's face and Kobe would take these blind uh, jump shots. And what he would do, he knew it was it was somebody that was going to be defending him this upcoming season. And he wanted to be able to make this shot pretty much with his eyes closed. And he practiced this shot constantly, constantly, constantly. So when you think about the level amount of hours that like a Kobe Bryant spends in a gym and the amount he studies other basketball players and um, historically and currently and how much he knows about the game, when he steps on that floor, 
he's way, way, way more advanced than, than everybody else because of the effort that he put into it off the court makes it feel like it's effortless on the court. And so, like, you know, I think that's a lot of what I see just across the multiple spaces that I work in, the sort of amount, uh, the amount of behind the scene work that goes in and that go and that runs super, super deep from a domain expertise standpoint that makes it seem uh, super easy, uh, you know, when, it, when, 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 when people see them do it. Sure. I would say not either or, but yes. And um, they have extraordinarily talent times and you multiply that by the effort. You know, a lot of people without the talent can't sustain that effort because they're yeah. not getting any return on their investment. So he was able to get a lot. Yeah. Talent. Think about how much talent Iver, Allen Iverson had. You know, I, I would bet that he had more talent than Kobe Bryant, come, at both of them coming into the league. So talented. And, and then Kobe surpassed him on, on the talent level by multiples, by the work that Kobe put in versus, you know, what, what the work that Allen, and Allen's one of my favorite players, but the what's real is real. Kobe, Kobe put in a lot more work. I hear you. I hear you. Um, but creativity is something more than just effort and work. Where does creativity come from? Where does the drive to innovate? You can't practice it. Yeah, I don't think you could practice it. I think, so So, what's interesting in creativity, I love watching, one of my favorite things to do is I love watching, I love being in the studio when songwriters are writing songs. And I love doing artist video, artist visits to, um, uh, to like visual artists, painters or, or sculptors going to their studios and, and, and watching them work. And it's like, it's almost like, this sort of download from, from, from God in terms of the like ideas and where these things come from. And one of the things that I've heard multiple songwriters say um, is, it, it, is that if they're not in this sort of quiet place and if they're not tuned in, mm. somebody else is going to get that song. That song is going to come that, like mm. that song comes from somewhere. <laughs> And you got to be tuned in, whether, you know, whether you want to call it spiritually, you know, whatever, you got to be tuned in to be able to, for, for it to be downloaded through you. So, so like, um, the other thing though, like sort of taking that sort of, um, that intangible piece of it is also met, like some of the best creators understand theory. And they understand rhythm and they understand sounds and they always sort of push in what's next. And like, you know, like it's, 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 it's certain producers who like a Max Martin, who I feel like is another genius, who's just one of the best pop music producers in history from all the way back through Britney Spears, uh, hit me baby one more time, all the way up to the weekend. I can't feel my face. You know, so he's like been doing this over decades and ha has had more number, number one hits. But it's like what he knows pop melody and, so and just sonically tuned in. And he studied pop music. So it's like and that's that Michael Jackson studied pop music. Michael Jackson studied the history of music. So it's like so I think it's this sort of. um the amount of work that goes into it and understanding the craft has to be married to sort of the intangible piece as well. I agree completely. And, you know, forgive me if I'm going outside my lane for a second, but I am really trying to be a pop, really a real pop psychologist. <laughs> and mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. study pop music <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot I can learn from other fields. Um, I don't know if it almost sounds crazy for a psychologist to say that, but I love no, I love hip hop. I love mm -hmm. pop music. I love pop culture. And the more that I can learn about, you know, what sticks in that world, I think I can actually apply that to know how to frame things so people really get interested in certain psychological concepts. What, what, gr what great pop songwriters know, um, and that you know, and, and, and it applies to to your world is like. 
um, we know about writing hooks and we know how important it is because melody and hook, you want, you want, you want people to make, to be able to remember it. You know what I'm saying? The, the repetition, like, you know, so in your world of, of, of talk shows or whatever, everybody remembers and you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Right. And you know, you remember <laughs> yeah, yeah. how people sign off of TV shows. Right. Um, like, yeah, so, Oprah. so it's this thing. Oh yes. And so you think about, um, you think about, repetition. You think about simplicity and, 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 and messaging. The other piece I think that um, pop artists do incredibly well and probably better than any other field is, um, is, is this connection between um, the, the person and, and fans. And sort of how do you build a, a, a connection? How do you bring audience along with you? How do you uh, build this, this sort of emotion, these emotional ties in between? And so, and, 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 I, and that's a part that, that I, I feel like pop stars have done incredibly well. You know, we, we've done a lot of work and a lot of studies around like iconography. And so, you know, like, you know, it, there's, there's things like, um, you know, in pop culture, what we, what we would say is a, a, a pop star is somebody that you could dress up for, uh, as for Halloween. And everybody know know everybody knows who you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, so like everybody knows who 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 you are. So, um, and I think you know, in terms of what what you do, it's like is is a million podcasts out there, but um, making sure that everything that you do stands out, so it doesn't blend mm -hmm. in with the wallpaper. <laughs> I teach an eight week online course called the transcend course. And I once had a Halloween, I, like I had all the students, I asked them to dress up. And so one of my students did dress up as me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That, That's great. That, that did happen. He actually like <laughs> took a cardboard cutout picture of me and put it on his face. <laughs> and everyone knew it was me <laughs> in the room. Yeah. Oh, That's so funny. Let's talk about the future of the future of this business because I think you're very prescient. You see a very uh, you you really see that things are changing in the music industry. You um, right now you work for you Q and A. I believe it's called Q and A, right? Yeah, uh, Ven right Venice, Venice is our operating company. Q and A is the Venice, parent company. Venice Innovation Labs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Is is as the full the full thing? Um, so. I love the name of that. First of all, <laughs> um, I love innovation. Can you tell me, you know, some things you think are on the horizon for the future of um, of the industry? I've read I've read a lot of your thoughts about it, but I'd love to hear it from your own mouth and 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 talk, telling our listeners um, what you where you see it's going or where you think it needs to go. Yeah, it um, it's coming it's coming really quick, and um, it's it's stuff that I didn't think I would see within my lifetime. And um, but I think AI is really going to change um, the face of music. And, you know, we're seeing these tools that are created that, that people are create have created already where they can take the voice of your uh, favorite artist, um, sample three seconds of that voice and then record into into the phone or whatever. Like a, mm -hmm. you could sing into the phone and it comes out in the same voice as that artist. So essentially, mm -hmm. if I wanted Adele and Sam Smith to make an album together, I can just sample bo both of their voices, go in and, 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 and sing these parts. And, you wow. know, all of a sudden you got this duets album between Sam Smith and Adele. And when you take that and when you layer when you layer on all of the um, AI and deep fakes around around video and, and this auto generated content to go alongside of it. We won't be able to tell real artists from 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 fake artists anymore. And so, wow. yeah, we won't be able to tell. And so, you know, one of my concerns is that, you know, when you when you listen to platforms like a Spotify or Apple Music, the average listener doesn't really care what comes on next. So they listen through playlists. So, you know, so you may enter on your favorite song and it might be, you know, an Ed Sheeran song that, you know, that kicks off your today's top hits playlist. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're cleaning your house and you hear a Bruno Mars song and then you hear 
a Beyonce song or, or, or a Drake record. And what you're not going to realize is it's not even them. It's just all sound alike. Who gets and the money? Whoever, whoever creates the sound alikes. And so, you know, my guess is, you know, with platforms like TikTok, who's like way ahead of, of everybody else in terms of AI, companies like that are just going to create their own artists because they don't want to pay for music. Music is expensive for those platforms. So they, they're not going to want to play for music, so play, uh, pay for music. So I think we're going to see a lot of these platforms create these sound alike artists that sound like our favorite artists. And um, it's, it's almost going to be like how stores, you go in a supermarket and all of a sudden every supermarket started creating their own brands. So it's like, <laughs> well, well, welcome, welcome to, to save a lot, to save a lot of music. But do you think people will buy it? Like, not just physically buy it, but, but buy that premise. Like, don't you think they always will want the most authentic version of it? No, I think, I think there'll be artists that'll stand out that people will still want to buy into and become fans of that have a point of view that they want to see in concerts. Um, but I don't I, 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 like I, by no means do I think this is going to permanently replace real artists. But I do think there's going to be a huge, huge, gigantic market for fake artists. Hmm. And because uh, under copyright law and trademark law, you can't trademark your voice. Mm. You can trademark, you know, that you yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Likeness and 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 you can copyright songs, but you can't tra- you can't trademark a voice. That is so interesting. How will that affect mass? Oh, who owns the masters and stuff? It'll just be the whoever created the program. <laughs> whoever creates the whoever creates the program control c- controls the master and make and makes the money. It could be like a some fifteen year old in the basement of the grandma's house, you know, with no friends who is, is becomes a, a pop superstar. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? <laughs> yes. Or, 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 and what I, and what I see is, is going to be bot fact is going to be bot factories, right? You know, you look at bot yeah. farms and um, all of this is AI generated. So they're just going to sample who are the most popular artists. These bot, mm-hmm. these um, AI can create these songs, you know, pretty much instantly. You could go to chat GPT and say, write me a song about X, Y, Z in the style of this person. And they're going to write, you know, they're going to write that song. And, they, you know, these bots are going to spit these things out. But what if like the, the authentic artist, the real artist, like changes, changes their style, changes their mind. Like I had someone try that, like some New York Times columnist. He's like, is this what Scott Barry Kaufman would say about creativity? Um, and they showed me something that they generated from chat GPT and he wanted my comment on it. And I was like, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I guess I, that is something I would have said 10 years ago. But, you know, I don't know if, I, you know, I, I've, th- I've changed my thoughts about it a little bit, you know, but I, I feel like there's something deep here where it's not allowing artists to evolve and grow because it's doing so much prediction. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the stage that we're at with, with, with chat GPT. <laughs> And, um, and, and and we're at the very, very, very beginning stages, very beginning stages. So we're at, we're at AOL dial up stage right now. And look how advanced okay. it is, you know, Fair enough. like, so, so Fair when enough. you, when you, when you see how advanced this thing is and how fast it is, and this is at its mm-hmm. very beginning stages, by the end of next year is going to be way beyond where it's at right now. So I think, you know, as fast as an artist can move is going to be as fast as artificial intelligence can, can adjust. And, you know, so I, um, I think what's going to be important, though, is this is when artists are going to have to build real emotional connections with fans. This is when putting on live, really great live shows and having real point of views as an artist are going to count. And because I, I think, you know, what we saw d- during the streaming age of music is a um, hundred thousand songs a day being uploaded on on Spotify? A lot of artists who um, who hadn't invested in really building careers, you know. So we we've seen a lot of not so great music. So it's gonna ma- it's gonna force artists to be better at 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 this point. And so I think we'll get a lot of standouts 
from, you know, from artists who are real. Yeah, I totally see that. What do you see as the future of talent, um, talent spotting, you know, not, not just management, but I'm talking about spotting, you know, um, what, you know, how can we, the, the, the kids that don't have the privileges, don't have the opportunities to get their stuff out there, but they have the talent. What can we do to really kind of increase the chances that they'll be discovered? I, th- I think it's connect. You know that we the, the the beauty of uh, platforms like like a like a TikTok um, and, and YouTube as well is that these are these are tools where you can upload things yourself, let people connect with you, with your personality, and because the, the the thing I found with with, with artists, it, it's never been just about the music. You can't build stars that way. You could build a you could build a catalog, but it's hard to build stars. Building real stars has always been about does this person have a unique point of view? Are they going to be able to connect? Like so when you look at like like one of the things like with with somebody like Megan Trainer who I love like a, a, like a uh, she's like a, a a little sister. Megan when she came out with all about that bass, she was straight about like, I'm not your average pop star. I'm going to talk about um, body shaming. I'm going to talk about being proud of your size, I, you know, it, and, and I'm going to I'm going to show girls that it doesn't matter what shape you are, how confident that you could be. You could be bad. And that's and that's who she was. And people, they didn't just buy into the song. They bought into her. And that's why she's still uh, sustaining to this very day. And like, you know, when you think about like uh, John Legend's activism and, and like yeah. people like he had a he has a very real point of view on things, whether you agree with them or not. He's 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 open about his positions on on the world. Um, Gaga with LGBTQ issues from the very beginning, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and she, you know, she was a voice for a very young generation you know, pre don't ask, don't tell, you know? So, so like, I think, you know, just being able to express your point of view alongside of your creativity, I think is a thing that, that builds emotional connection between uh, um, an artist and their audience. So, so it brings, it shows your personality. So, um, so I think being able to use these sort of self upload tools like a TikTok or, or YouTube or, you know, whatever that medium may be, um, we're, we're seeing a lot in the podcast space. You know, my friends from Philly, uh, Gillian Wallow have this podcast million dollars worth of game. And these are guys who, you know, just bar- they, these would be the guys that are in the barbershop, just, you know, talking shit all day with a strong point of view about sports, pop culture, you know, uh, relationships. They have, you know, one of the biggest podcasts now. But, you know, because people bought into um, their, their point of view and their personality. So I just would use the tools that are available. Man, I want you to be my manager. <laughs> I mean, I am your manager. What are you talking about? Oh, I mean, I mean, I mean, you are. <laughs> are, we allowed, are we allowed to make that announcement? No. Um, <laughs> you and my dad. You and my dad. I love your dad. He, 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 share, he shares that with you. Yeah, I love him too. He's my best friend. And you met him, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think probably my last question is um, about independent labels. You know, I don't think they get as much love as they should. I, I think you agree with that. What's the, what's the next wave? What's the next wave of independent labels? You know, it's just it's, it's me back in that seat of, of uh, rooting for the underdog. You know? Yeah, come on. <laughs> come no, on. I just, I just saw, you know, these, these independent labels and independent artists were sort of getting a short end of the stick throughout the industry. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and it was a very sort of hard, long road, the, 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 the travel and a, a lonely road to travel. So, you know, we, we just kind of looked at the space and said, you know, how can we help advocate, you know, behind the scenes first to be able to get them better royalty rates, better terms, make sure it's competitive with, you know, the, with the major labels and then sort of built this company that sort of helps them build their businesses. So, you know, when I looked at what Shopify and Square were able to do for like independent entrepreneurs and sort of like, not just sort of build the the point of sale systems for them, 
but how can we teach them and give them the information and tools to become better entrepreneurs? You know, we thought about like, how can we help independent artists and independent labels do that? So, you know, we built the technology and the services um, to help them accomplish that. But, you know, we feel like, you know, just being able to empower people to be able to bet on themselves, to work for themselves, um, to wake up in the morning every single day, you know, doing doing what they love to do. And, um, you know, I got inspired by I did a trip to Cuba with my team from Spotify. And um, and every every everywhere we would go, we would go to these restaurants and bars and it was like these amazing musicians and all of these like I mean, like some of the best musicians I've heard, like on every instrument, vocally, everywhere I was going. And I was asking the guy in us everywhere. I said um, I, I, I made that comment and he said he says one of the one good things about socialism is that. Um, they get paid to do, you know, to work on what they want to work on every single day. And uh, he said, he said this to a capitalist, by the way. But so, so, but what I walked away with was when you're able to work on your craft like that every single day, you just get better and better and better. And when you think about and, and with creatives in America, for the most part, you, you got to be an Uber driver half the time or a Lyft driver or, or, you're working, you know, two or three jobs to sort of pay for your recording studio time. And so you can't do that Kobe Bryant thing and be in the gym 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can't be in a studio working on what you want to work on. So, you know, we, we've been able to give artists the ability to sort of quit their jobs and make money by doing this full time. And like every time an artist tells me that they were able to leave their job and do music full time, it just, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it, fills me up well i love what you're putting out in the world you know i uh i'm creating this uh program on for self-actualization coaching and you're kind of i mean you're the og self-actualization coach <laughs> over there you never maybe i framed it that way but um that's no, what you I, are you should do delusional <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you are no well de delusional until it's not right right you know <laughs> bet on yourself bet on yourself yes sir. um well, Troy, thank you so much for being on my show today. It was a real, real honor. Been no, thank you. Thank you, man. I, I always love talking to you. You know, I just think you're, you're a genius just you're, yourself. Uh, you're, oh, you're, you're, you're one, you're you. one of one. It's been great getting to know you. And, Likewise. you know, I, I just, I want, I want to be able to look back in 20 years and yes. like, and be able to say, you know, I, I really saw this journey because I, I think I think out of everything that you've accomplished so far and which you've accomplished a, a, a ton, man, you got so much runway in front of you. I, I can't wait to see. Thanks, Troy. That, I mean, that means the world to me. So thank you. Now, th thank you, man. Let, let's 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 have some fun together. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.